Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. I'm Troy Moling, and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Hope everyone is doing well. Lots to get to in this week's broadcast. And before we get started, we do want to mention as United States and global health officials continue to address the spread of COVID-19, UNL is also monitoring the situation. Updates can be found at the address on the screen and on the Market Journal website. So beginning today's show, Grocery stores continue to be stocked with food, but disruptions in the supply chain are being felt through some parts of the ag industry. I spoke with Darren Newsom, president of Darren Newsom Analysis, about that and got some updates from him on what else he's tracking in the markets. Last week, I heard something that I never thought I would hear in my lifetime. There's no demand for bacon pork bellies were being loaded on, and this is from a good source that, that I have out in the industry, uh, pork bellies were being loaded onto rendering trucks at the packing plants. That to me was just astounding. And then you add in the fact that, again, from the same source, that uh, anything, uh, last week, anything over 150 pounds wasn't going to be bought. This, uh, this week, anything, uh, anything less than 220 pounds wasn't going to be bought. So. We're seeing it in the pork, we're seeing it in the cattle where last week we saw cash bids pulled uh, at, the, at the end of the week. So we are having some supply chain upheavals here. We're, you know, there, we're having you know, positive cases coming in at some packing plants. So I've heard, I haven't heard of many closing down, but there have been some positive cases. I know there was one plant in Canada that got shut down. So there is that threat and it's certainly, at least last week, leaped over into the futures market and into the cash. Darren, what's been the big area of concern producers have right now, and what advice do you have for them? The biggest concern out there, and it's almost commodity-wide, is demand. You know, we don't, see, you know, demand for corn is down on all three categories. Soybeans, we don't have any export demand. We have good crush demand because of the amount of cattle on, on feed and hogs as well, uh, since we don't have any DDGs, we have ethanol plants shutting down. So demand is the key issue. Wheat's still doing okay, uh, but even its demand starting to slow the livestock sector as a whole. Demand, again, as we just talked about, is, is being hurt. So as we're heading into planting season, the biggest issue out there is demand. How are we going to rebuild demand? And where is this new interest going to come from? I don't see it happening. Uh, if we look at corn, again, the best chance we have is for feed demand. If we look at soybeans, the best demand that we have is crush demand. Uh, but that's going to come at the expense of some of, uh, of of the you know, DDGs for, uh, for corn. So I don't see any new demand avenues out there. The U.S. dollar remains strong. Brazilian real remains weak. So, you know, there's not going to be this sudden rush by the world's largest buyer to start looking at U.S. commodities unless something dramatic happens. And right now, I just don't see that happening. Going back to soybeans for a second, and you mentioned crush, is that a reason why the futures for soybeans aren't as bearish as some other commodities? We've, you know, the last week or so, the last, I'm going to say the last couple of weeks, we did see some spillover demand from the soybean meal market, but then soybean meal collapsed as well. The funny thing about soybeans is, is it doesn't look as bad, but if you look at the big picture, if you look at the cash market, if you look at everything taken into account together, then soybeans have actually lost just as much, if not more ground than corn and Soybeans are still projecting a much more bearish, the cash soybean market is still projecting a much more bearish supply and demand situation than corn. The interesting thing about corn is we were really, we were testing the 2018 low here uh, early this week and we held it. We saw bases start to firm. So that was one bullish sign is that we did not take out the 2018 low in the cash corn market. So Darren, long term, would you recommend holding onto corn or soybeans? What do you think the opportunities are? You know, what's really strange after everything that I just said, if I look at the forward curve of those two markets, corn versus soybeans, 
and this is just crazy to me. This is something I'm still trying to wrap my head around. The more bullish long-term structure of a market is soybeans. Mm. I can't, I can't justify it if I look at any of the fundamentals, but if I look at just the forward curve and I look at how basis has been doing the long term, uh, longer term, the more bullish market still conti continues to be soybeans. Thanks to Darren for being on the show. Also joining me this week is Dr. Frayne Olson, ag economist from North Dakota State University. And I wanted to get in a few questions with him about the wheat market. And starting off, I asked Fran to give us a sense of where ag is right now and how a farmer should approach this new normal, however long that may be. Obviously, there's a lot of unanswered questions and, and it, the, the grain markets in particular are really looking to the outside markets for some direction right now. Um, you know, we, we, it's kind of a quiet time on the supply demand side. Yes, we're, we're worried about planted acreage and what might be happening, but most of this is on a demand side on um, how quickly are we going to see kind of a recovery? When do we think the bottom is going to be in in the markets? Uh, when I look at the charts now today, it, in, it, it's looking like wheat and soybeans may have put a bottom in. Again, it's open for debate. Uh, we'll wait to see. Um, it, but I'd, I'm not 100% convinced that the corn market has put a bottom in yet, both short-term and long-term, uh, mainly because of the downward pressure from ethanol. Uh, the most common question I'm getting from farmers, from industry folks is, so when do I think the bottom's going to be in? How bad could this get? And then also, how quickly do you, do you think the recovery will come? Um, and that's anybody's guess. Uh, based on what I see right now today, my best estimate is probably... Uh, uh, July, mid to late July will be when we start to see the recovery on the demand side in particular. It's going to take a while for um, the psychology of the market to shift. I don't think that will happen until it looks like the number of new cases of COVID-19 is starting to drop off, where, where people start making more effort to look at uh, when do we start lifting restri restrictions, when does it look like our demand base will start to rebuild. So uh, based on my calendar right now, my best guess is probably midsummer. Um, as far as the recovery, I do think agriculture will be one of those industries that will cover a bit more quickly than some of the others across the United States. Um, I expect to see some, uh, a fairly quick rebound to a level and then after that a much slower growth. Um, the other thing is I, I am expecting that the U.S. recovery, domestic demand, will recover a little bit faster than the international demand. So this isn't necessarily going to hit all of the grains equally when it comes to recovery. When you look at futures prices, wheat is really about the only thing going in a positive or semi-positive direction. Is this just something as simple as people going to the grocery store and buying all their baking needs since that's a new hobby for a lot of folks, or is it something more than that? Well, again, I think there's two reasons for that. Part of it is that, yes, the domestic demand has shifted a bit. Um, that as, as people are staying home now, and I know at, at, in my home, you know, we've got some kids, you know, to, to make some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunch or to cook up some macaroni and cheese for lunch is, is, is a bread product. Those are wheat-based products. Um, we're kind of going back to the basics right now in, in a lot of our buying habits. Um, so the domestic demand has been relatively stable or, or strong. Um, the other thing that's happening internationally, some of our big international competitors, in particular in the Black Sea for both Russia and Ukraine, are starting to put some export restrictions on. They're starting to put some limits on the amount of grain that can be exported from the country. Um, their currency has dropped very quickly, which has given them a price advantage, but as a result, their exports have, for the last several weeks, have been growing. So they're concerned about over-exporting for their domestic needs. So they're starting to put some restrictions on, which then opens up the door to some U.S. wheat entering the marketplace. Um, we obviously have quite a bit of wheat in inventory right now, so our wheat supplies are very comfortable. Um, so it's a combination of shifting domestic demand, but also some international opportunities. And, and I think the futures market is looking to say I, I, they're expecting, I think, some better wheat export sales as we move into the spring time frame. Um, most of the winter wheat is in pretty good condition right now. Uh, we, we don't know exactly what the weather's going to be up here in the northern plains for the spring wheat plantings yet, but uh, the planting intentions were for a, a, actually a reduction in spring wheat acreage. We'll wait to see whether that actually happens or not. And Frayne, if you can, leave us with some good news today. What are some positives that we can learn from everything that's going on right now? 
Sure. I, I guess if there's any consolation that comes out of this, there's, there's two pieces. I think, number one, when we've seen the economic contraction going on, when we've seen how um, our, our the, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted different industries across the United States, yes, we've seen a drop in agriculture, but the, in a relative sense, the drop in ag and ag prices has not been as severe or aggressive as some other industries. The other thing is that I do think the rebound in agriculture and, and agricultural industries will be a bit faster. I think the recovery will come a bit faster in agriculture than it will in other industries. So right now, I know it's very difficult. We just got to try and be patient, uh, wait for this to work its way through the system. So I do think there's going to be better times ahead. I do think the domestic market for, for ag and ag products will recover fairly quickly from this. The international market, again, I think will be a little bit slower, but that, that will also come. Uh, again, food tends to be one of those basic um, um, things we need, basic necessities. Uh, people are going to be very focused on, on this recovery and how do we come out of this in a positive sense. So, you know, there are better times in the coming. Thanks again to Frayne for being on the show as well. Next up, for Ty and Jay Stugenholtz, hemp harvesting isn't their first rodeo. The brothers, who are farmers and engineers, have been designing and inventing biomass harvesting equipment for more than 20 years. So it may not be surprising to learn that their latest invention, the FarmMax Interceptor, a combine attachment designed to harvest all main components of a hemp plant, didn't exist before October 2019. Yet by this spring, the Stukenholtz brothers will be commercialized to pre-sell units to growers for fall. Read about the Farmax Interceptor in the April Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market General Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, how's it look for Easter weekend and beyond? Well, that's why we've seen quite a week, and it looks like we're going to see quite a weekend. We've seen the very warm temperatures earlier in the, to the middle of the week, record te temperatures across portions of the state. Now we're dealing with a very significant storm system that's moving out into the central plains. And unfortunately for those that want to do their Easter egg hunt, this could probably be a rather nasty Easter day with the snow, the rain, and the very strong wind. So basically one of those days, just hunker down inside, let it blow over before starting to see some improving conditions. More importantly, because we're getting close to planting, we're a little concerned with this colder, uh, rainier weather coming back in to the region as we're getting very close to that time where we can kick things off. So hopefully as we get into the longer range, there are some signs that at least some warmer temperatures are coming in, although there is a little bit more uncertainty in regards to precipitation. Certainly does not look like at this point a long extended cold spot. So let's look at what's going on presently. And the first thing we'll draw your attention to is we have a wave in the northern stream coming out of the central Rockies, and we got the southern stream low, and they're going to merge to create a pretty powerful storm across the eastern half of the country at the surface. We're developing low in the southwestern portions of Kansas, perfect scenario to bring a lot of moisture up and ride it over top of the cold air. We start to see precipitation breaking across northern Nebraska as we go through the evening and afternoon hours, and that will start to slide southward during the overnight hours and the two systems will begin to merge and create one unified low pressure system moving up into the lower Ohio River Valley with cold air coming in well behind us. So we're going to get some pretty significant accumulating snowfall and we're changing that over to all snow during the day. Uh, rainfall snow in southeast and we'll see some accumulation in northwest Nebraska and then we'll see that cold air really funnel into the upper Midwest. We're going to see a couple of nice real cold days here in the central plains as that cold air follows the system. A few flurries up in the Dakotas but overall just a broad brutal cool day about 10 to 15 degrees below normal for highs. As we get into Tuesday you see that cold air kind of spreads out across most of the eastern United States. High pressure permanently in control in the northern and central plains. That means we're going to still continue to see cool conditions. There is an impulse coming on the back side of this system that may generate a few snow flurries, but we're going to see temperatures are going to be confined into the 40s to the low 50s in southwest. And as we go into Wednesday, we start to see some return flow around this high pressure system. So we should start to see some moderation of temperature, particularly in western Nebraska. One system is expected to go through the southern plains, just skirting southern Nebraska. I check kick off a few flurries of light precipitation. But on Thursday, we finally start to see a relaxation of this trough. Much warmer weather tries to start building its way in. Do see a low pressure developing in the Texas Panhandle, but it looks like most of the moisture for that system will be starved by the big system off the eastern United States. We'll start to see temperatures returning back to the 50 degree mark across eastern Nebraska. And then on Friday, another system moves through during the overnight hours into early Friday morning. 
quickly moving toward the southeast. Warm air tries to once again build back in for the weekend. Looks like we're going to have some decent weather, pretty close to normal temperatures. And as we go a little bit farther out into the sequence from next Thursday to the following Tuesday, that cold air gets reinforced back into the Great Lakes and potentially dropping down into portions of the northern plains. And in regards to precipitation, with a more northerly flow, precipitation source from the Gulf is not there. So we seem to see a drier pattern. The one flying the ointment is a several waves trying to move out the Central Rockies may skirt southwestern Nebraska and through the western portions of the High Plains region, so we'll watch out for that. But overall, it looks like a very rotten week coming up before we start to see a warming trend the third week of the month. Thanks, Al. Next up, with the rise of COVID-19, the importance of disease traceability has become paramount here at home. And that same notion still rings true for our food supply. While the concept of traceability isn't new, there's been a mindset shift in recent years. In August of 2018, Cattle Trace Incorporated was created as a private not-for-profit corporation to secure, maintain, and manage data collected for disease traceability. As we rang in the new year, Cattle Trace Incorporated formally changed its name to U.S. Cattle Trace as the program continues to expand from its current pilot program. Market Journal's Bill Dodd has the story. Only a few years back, finding cattle that may have been vulnerable to disease was a very time-consuming process that required information from auction houses, feedlots, packing plants, so on and so forth. But in June of 2018, the Cattle Trace program was created to help streamline the process of tracking diseases in live cattle. In that time, several other states, including Nebraska, have signed on to the program. However, there is one caveat. The program is completely voluntary. This has prompted many independent cattle ranchers to decline joining because many feel it's not worth the time it takes to comply with the program or for fears of invasions of privacy. The, the, the three items I would say that probably concern people the most about joining the program are the questions. Let's, let's rephrase it that way, questions they ask. Tremendous amount of concerns about data privacy, government intrusion, and U.S. Cattle Trace is a nonprofit 501c3 company that owns the database. And that's extremely important as we talk about data privacy because it's free from Freedom of Information Act. So the government go, or the, the information goes into the private database. And yes, the producer board of directors, they set those policies and procedures, how that data is accessed. But it's really kept confidential and only used in a disease outbreak. So how exactly does the cattle trace system work? As it happens, the USDA already requires animals traveling between states to have an ID tag and vet certificate. However, the rule excludes animals under 18 months. Furthermore, cattle tags vary. The Cattle Trace program seeks to use one type of tag, an ultra-high-frequency tag that would streamline the data collection. I show up at our feed yard today or tomorrow, whatever, and we have an animal that uh, shows signs and symptoms from foot and mouth disease. Well, let's talk about the worst-case scenario. You enter in that individual ID number into the database, and then it'll be able to say, okay, who is its last contact? We can't really ask the cow. The cow won't talk to us. You got to enter in his number. It goes into the database, and then it'll quickly be able to tell us who was the last contacts or that contact tracing, who was the last contacts with that animal. Not only that, but where are they now? And then you go find those contacts, those other animals, and exactly who have they contacted and where are those animals now. Disease traceability will not prevent a disease outbreak. That's that's clear. I think we all know that. Mm -hmm. But what it will do, hopefully, is be able to very quickly isolate the animals that are at risk, quarantine them, and hopefully stop the spread of the disease, just like we're trying to do a social distancing, quarantines, that type of stuff. There are so many parallels, so many parallels between the COVID-19 situation, everything that's surrounding that, and how that could apply to an animal disease um, situation and then how specifically the, the answers that Cattle Trace is providing um, for the, uh, the cattle industry. By keeping better tabs on diseases feared most by cattle producers such as BSE, foot and mouth disease, TB, and a slew of others, Cattle Trace is effectively benefiting producers, packers, and consumers all in one fell swoop. If we look back a few years to the outbreak of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or mad cow disease as many people know it, the cattle markets in the United States took a staggering blow. With the finding of BSE uh, was announced in the United States back in 2003, beef markets effectively disappeared, beef export markets effectively disappeared overnight. 
because the U.S. was no longer a BSE-free country. Well, as we investigated and determined the source of the cow and determined the extent of the, uh, of the infection and effectively controlled it, um, we regained our status as a reliable supplier of beef. But we didn't regain those markets as quickly. That type of contamination and subsequent market fears are precisely what the Cattle Trace program was designed to curb. To be able to get back to regain that market share that we lost because our, our trading partners across the, uh, across the world didn't want our product, or one, because it was quote unquote, or had, an, had a BSC animal in our system and we didn't have a traceability system in it. But it took us roughly seven years to regain that market share back on a dollars per head basis. So cut it in half, and then not only that, it took us seven years to regain that. But really, our vision is to build a disease traceability system, an interstate, a highway system, if you will, that's built specifically for disease traceability, for disease traceability only. But we want to be able to build this highway system, this disease traceability system, this infrastructure, build it in such a way that value-add companies can come along and use that highway system to exchange information up and down the value chain. We're currently supporting several different efforts of private companies that are wanting to do just that, and they're wanting to, for lack of a better word, leverage then the infrastructure we're trying to build or, or use that system to be able to exchange that information up and down. So the second thing I'd say is we got the exports and then we got this. So our vision is we're going to create this platform uh, for future value-add opportunity. One more question many producers are asking is probably the most obvious question of all, and that is, how much will it cost me to get involved in this program? Brandon tells me that answer will vary depending on your role in the cattle industry. I'm asking for a dollar per head participation fee. With that dollar per head, we send you a tag. So however you want to say that, um, basically a dollar per head or dollar per tag to participate. Feed yards, feeding companies such as myself um, have all uh, stepped up to the plate and said, hey, we're willing to invest in infrastructure and the readers and the antennas to actually be able to, to trace the cattle. Uh, sale barns, we participate in and work with them to be able to um, install readers in their place. And then the packers as well have stepped up to install the readers and antennas at their place. So it depends on where you're at within the industry, um, but from a cow-calf standpoint, really it's a dollar per head to participate in the pilot project phase. While the country continues to contain the current threat of the coronavirus, the visionaries of the U.S. Cattle Trace are working diligently to make sure if a pandemic like this ever hits our cattle supply chain, the cattle industry will be prepared to locate, isolate, and terminate the problem. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. Finally today, there are many weather events which can impact a producer's yield. Flash drought has been around for a while, but was recently defined by a group of scientists and the American Meteorological Society. Market Journal's Maddie McIntosh has more on the story. With the warmth of summer just around the corner, everyone's thinking about what kind of weather this season will bring. Director of UNL's National Drought Mitigation Center, Dr. Mark Savota, wants to help producers understand a weather phenomenon called flash drought which covered 44% of the Southeast in less than a month last season. The critical thing with these flash droughts is timing. Um, you tend to see these in the warm season, and really if they hit during a critical time in the growing season for say corn or soybeans, it can have a large, large economic impact and really decimate crops very quickly. Dr. Sabota, along with 22 other authors, published a paper following a 2018 workshop at the Aspen Global Change Institute. The conference addressed flash droughts, and experts were able to create a definition for the term Mark coined nearly 20 years ago. That was for a, a, a non-electronic paper. It was USA Today, actually, at that time. And But when the drought, a big flash drought came back around in 2012, it really got a lot of traction. That was a big drought that affected over two-thirds of the country. It came on in a little over four weeks. So it was a very different type of drought, but we're trying to define it based on how fast or how rapidly it evolves. Not to be confused with maybe flash flood where it comes and it's gone just in a few hours or something like that. Really, we define it as any rapid onset drought that has a rapid intensification and accumulates in impacts across one or more sectors, whether that's agricultural. If the drought lingers on, it could end up being a hydrological drought. What really 
sort of compounds the problem. You see sort of this issue of droughts that develop this quickly tied to things like heat waves. And this is more like hot, windy, dry, sunny conditions, high evapotranspiration rates, and it really, it really just sucks the water out of the system much, much more quickly. When it comes to predicting flash droughts, it can be difficult as the droughts don't always reflect the same circumstances as each other. You just can't compare them easily to one another based on when did they start, how fast did they grow, how fast did they intensify, how long did they last, what caused them to end, and then how large of an area do they cover. All of those variables are different every single drought. And so that's what makes them very difficult, A, to forecast, and B, get everybody on the same page when you're talking about defining the characteristics of these types of droughts. We have certain conditions where we look at uh, conditions across the various oceans and the sea surface temperatures of these bodies, these large bodies of water, are really what drives the atmosphere, um, the conveyor belt of moisture and, and where do storms set up and where don't they set up. And that's where we can, can get into sort of the flash drought arena where it's, it's more of the sub-seasonal forecasting on the order of what's going to happen in the next week two weeks or four weeks. Flash droughts can also be harder to prepare for since they're not as predictable as normal droughts and are challenging to deal with. They typically would happen during the season. So it's not like you could have made different decisions three months ago in regards to seed type, the things that might be beyond your control once that, that crops in the ground. But a drought's very challenging to deal with because of that, just for that reason. We just can't see it coming on a satellite image like we do a hurricane or a radar like we do a tornado. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Maddie McIntosh. Mark also tells Maddie that ongoing changes to technology within the drought monitor will help to better predict flash droughts in the future. That's gonna do it for this week's show. Remember, if you missed a story, you can download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. And don't forget, you can get the latest on the coronavirus outbreak at covid19.unl.edu. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching and have a happy Easter. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.